bridge are you out of your mind? Listen, I don't care if it's officially canon. We are not talking about the fables. Besides, it's not even... Oh, <clears throat> The toughest challenge that the Muppets ever faced was moving forward without Jim Henson. His unexpected death in May of 1990 was a heartbreaking shock to his friends and family, as well as to the entire world, and left Kermit and the gang's future to become uncertain. Could they continue to put on a show when Kermit the Frog's human alter ego was no longer leading the team? They knew it was going to be emotionally difficult, but they were going to try anyways. As some were taking on Jim's positions that he left empty, like his son Brian taking charge as the head of the company and the director of the next Muppet content, along with Steve Whitmire working with Kermit, the team brought back the Muppets to the big and small screen to prove that the show must go on, even after going through a critical tragedy. As a result, with the help of Disney to distribute their projects, the gang were able to create what are now considered some of the most iconic moments in the Muppets history, like the Muppet Christmas Carol and Muppet Treasure Island, along with a new Muppet show-like series called Muppets Tonight, which did not last long, but it did do better than the Jim Henson Hour. It took a few years, but the Muppets were able to find their confidence back to get things started again. And with that newfound confidence, they decided to make another movie where they boldly went where no Muppet had gone before. Except for the Kuzbanians and the Swine Trek crew. In 1999, the Muppets returned to theaters for their sixth feature, Muppets from Space. It's the story of Gonzo, who has grown tired of always being called a whatever and having no one, not even himself, know what kind of species he actually is. One day, everything changed when he received a message that he may not be the only one of his kind. It's just that the rest are not from Earth. And on his pursuit to contact what could be his long-lost family, Agent Singer of the secret security facility Covenet captures Gonzo to prove to his boss that aliens are indeed real, along with holding Rizzo hostage for their testing. So it's up to the rest of the Muppets to rescue their friends before they face any harm by the hands of Covenet's surgeons, or even before the aliens come for Gonzo. In 1995, Brian Henson made a joint venture with Sony to create Jim Henson Pictures, whose goal was to produce family-friendly movies for the studio, which they were lacking at the time. While ideas like the gorilla biopic Buddy or an unmade Into the Woods adaptation were tossed around, Brian wanted to craft more Muppet material regularly, to avoid extensive waiting time. When the Jim Henson Company wanted to produce another Muppet movie after Muppet Treasure Island, one theme that they knew must be included was science fiction, especially if the feature would be released during the same summer as Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. At the same time, they also wanted to bring back the characterization of the first movie, where instead of the Muppets taking on a new persona for the picture, they were presented as being themselves. What we wanted to do was sort of return to the first movie. The, f the first movie were the Muppets as real people, real characters alive in, in America. And, and it's the story of Kermit finding the others and arriving in Hollywood. All the other movies since then have really been putting on a show of one sort or another. So we wanted to do a movie that continued the first movie that says, okay, now I know the Muppets are alive and the Muppets have been making all these movies and stuff, but where do they really live? And how do they live? And, 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 and how do they get along? So, so we've sort of done a movie that kind of fits closest with the first one. With the concept in place, several scripts were written that played with the sci-fi theme that featured elements of space parodies. However, most of them ended up going nowhere. One was a straightforward Pigs in Space movie. Another script, written by Kirk Thatcher, was called Muppets in Space, where Kermit was abducted by aliens because they thought he was their long-lost leader, and the gang set out on a space-traveling mission to save him. On a side note, the latter was close to being developed, as the company announced the project in 1998. Also, at the same time as the announcement, 
Welch's was promoting limited time jelly glasses with the theme of Muppets in Space, even using the title for their advertisements. However, there may be a chance that this could be a major coincidence because there's no confirmation that this was directly related to the proposed movie. In the end, the script that was chosen was the one written by Jerry Jewell and later revised by Joey Mazzarino, which was a little similar to Thatcher's, but centralized on Gonzo with the tentative title Star Gonzo. The reason why that one became the winner was because it had the most heart, as his version was inspired by Gonzo's song in the Muppet movie, I'm going to go back there someday. As for the director, after helming the last two movies, Brian Henson decided to step aside from the job so that someone else could give the Muppets a fresh new take. He initially hired Grease director Randall Kleiser to lead the project, as he previously helmed a sci-fi family film with Flight of the Navigator. However, after the movie was given the green light, Brian felt that he wasn't a good fit for the picture. Instead, they brought on board a filmmaker who was working as a writer on Nickelodeon shows like Rocco's Modern Life and Kablam to make his directorial debut named Tim Hill. Now, during production, Hill was said to be a nice guy. I mean, there's nothing bad to say about him. It's just that Mazzarino had serious issues with all the changes that he wanted to do with the script, including getting rid of all the parodies that would go and spoof films like Alien, Contact, or Men in Black, and then he would go and replace that all with more heartfelt moments. You know, try to be more real. But the thing that really made Mazzarino quit the entire production was the film's new ending. In the original draft, the aliens turned out to be ugly monsters that actually have no relation to Gonzo. They were actually just so mesmerized by his crazy stunts in The Muppet Show, and they decided that they're just going to make themselves look like him because, well, they thought he was the ultimate being. While the question of what species Gonzo is remained unanswered, it ultimately didn't matter because he knows that his real family is the Muppets, even if they're not related by blood. But despite the writer opposing the notion, Hill decided to go and switch that ending entirely anyways so that he could go and confirm that Gonzo is an alien and that those extraterrestrials are indeed related to him. Similar to Muppet Treasure Island, Frank Oz did participate in the movie, but only to provide the voice, as he was too busy directing his own movies, leaving other performers to play as his characters like Ricky Boyd as Animal, John Kennedy as both Fozzie and Sam, and Peter Linz as Miss Piggy. Interestingly enough, there were a couple of instances where the public got to hear Linz as Piggy. It wasn't on the movie though, but rather in the trailer and on a Wendy's commercial promoting the tie-in toys. Listen everyone, listen, I've got great news! Also, this movie marks as the first appearance of Scooter since Muppet Vision 3D, which that was the last time Richard Hunt performed as the character before he passed away in 1992. For this film, Hunter's brother Adam brought Scooter back to life. Get your Gonzo t-shirts right here, 10 bucks! Muppets from Space is noted to be the first Muppet movie to not be a musical, or even not have any original songs featured. What they did instead is fill the soundtrack with already existing funky music like James Brown's Get Up Off of That Thing, The OJ's Survival, and The Commodore's Brick House. There were some songs that did get an update for the feature, like a new version of Shining Star by the Dust Brothers, and Flashlight to turn it into a duet with George Clinton and Pepe. There was also going to be an updated version of the song that inspired the movie, I'm Going to Go Back There Someday, but it was dropped from the final film. However, it did get released a few years later on the album of The Muppet Show's 25th anniversary. I'm going to go back there someday. When Muppets from Space crash landed in theaters on July 14th, 1999, let's just say that the results were as bad as a crash landing. Critics were not too fond of the picture, stating that while the elements that made the Muppets iconic are still noticeably there, like the heart and the humor, there wasn't enough of that to make the picture fully worthwhile. 
As for the box office, it not only flopped, but it became the lowest grossing Muppet movie with only $16.6 .6 million domestically and a worldwide total of $22.3 million on a $24 million budget. That and the box office disappointments of two other projects, Buddy and Elmo and Grouchland, put a hold on any other theatrical Henson projects. The ones that came after went straight to video such as Kermit Swamp Years or were independent co-productions like Mirror Mask and Steve Barron's Rat. Because of its failed performance, both critically and financially, Muppets from Space is the movie, at least in terms of the ones released theatrically, that fans disregard the most and even consider it among the weakest projects released by the Muppets. In fact, not only do some of the team view it a bit negatively, but even the Muppets themselves feel the same way. With, with all due respect to Muppets from Space, um, you don't want that to be the last movie you ever do. Um, <laughs> you, want, you want to do a better one. And to show you more proof of that sentiment, then look no further than the great Gonzo himself. To this day, instead of being acknowledged as an alien like the feature established, Gonzo and everyone else still call him either a thing or a whatever. An epic love story between a very handsome, long-nosed purple thing and a beautiful chicken. <laughs> Gonzo with the wind. So not only do they reject the movie, but they also reject the canon that is the core of the story. But regardless of how anyone feels about the picture, this is still a noteworthy chapter in the Muppets' history, especially when this marks as the final Muppet project for Jerry Jewell before he passed away in 2005. As much as it may try to answer one of the franchise's biggest mysteries, the response to this film is very much like what Gonzo is. It's just... whatever. Shining star for you to see what your life can truly be. As the new millennium entered our time, the results of Muppets from Space exposed a problem that they tried to neglect. The team never got over Jim Henson's death. As much as they may try to move forward and produce new shows and movies to keep that Muppet spirit alive, Jim's absence was prevalent and it started to noticeably affect the quality of their current works. Even Tim Hill detected that the company was struggling to fill the gap that Jim left while directing Space. They may attempt to move right along and have the Muppets caroling, swashbuckling, and meeting aliens, not to mention maintaining their other businesses like Sesame Street and The Creature Shop, and teaming up with Hallmark in 1998 to create Muppet-themed channels that were short-lived like Odyssey Network in the US and Kermit Channel in Asia, but they became emotional distractions from the fact that the company was never the same now that Jim's gone. And throughout the 1990s, some were more aware than others. This was partially the reason why in 2000, Frank Oz announced that he was going to retire from puppeteering and left almost all of his characters in the hands of Eric Jacobson as Fozzie, Miss Piggy, Animal, Bert, and Grover, while David Rudman took over as Cookie Monster. The last time that fans got to hear him perform as Fozzie, Miss Piggy, and more was on the game's Muppet Race Mania and Muppet Monster Adventure that same year. The most that he would do with the Muppets from there was occasionally lend his voice to his roles on Sesame Street until 2012. The same happened with Jerry Nelson, where he continued to work with the Muppets until his retirement in 2004 and still provided their voices until his death in 2012. Like Jim learned in the last years of his life, running the company independently was becoming a challenge that was too much to bear for the Hensons. And so, on February of 2020, the Jim Henson Company in its entirety was sold to the German media company EMTV and Merchandising AG for $680 million. Now, this little moment right here when the Muppets made themselves at home at ENTV is just so fascinating. I mean, yeah, this has often been overlooked because, well, it was short-lived. But it really shouldn't because of why it was short-lived. 
Around the same time as the acquisition, EMTV was facing a massive economic crisis, and their new purchase was already been proven to be way too much for them. So much so that at the end of that same year, they had to sell the entire rights of Sesame Street to Sesame Workshop for $180 million. And from there, their main objective with Henson was to just sell it back to someone else. Now, granted, the Muppets were were still at work during this whole time, especially in 2002 when they released the Christmas TV special, It's a Very Merry Muppet Christmas, and the direct-to-home media movie Kermit Swamp Years, but nothing was doing any favors to EMTV. As much as they tried and had a few close calls to actually selling it, the Hanson family ultimately bought back their father's company for just $89 million. Considering the amount of money that they got back in 2000, just so they could go and buy it all back as if nothing happened at only a fraction of the cost, I think this would be considered what the social media people say. Daba yeah. Very good animal. However, there is just one problem with reclaiming the company. They're back to square one. I mean, yeah, sure, Sesame Street is now in good hands, but what about the Muppets? They still need a home where they could be treated as a valuable franchise. If only there were a major corporation out there with decades of experience of keeping legacy properties relevant and popular today with shows, movies, theme park rides, merchandise, and more, who always wanted to have the Muppets to be a part of their business for years. Oh, wait a minute. Hi, ho, Kermit the Frog here, and you're watching Disney Channel. Nice. On February 17th, 2004, after almost 15 years since the initial discussions with Jim, the Walt Disney Company officially acquired the Muppets for $75 million. It is worth noting, though, that this doesn't mean that they own everything from the Henson family. What Disney got from the deal was the intellectual property of the Muppets that's related to The Muppet Show, along with the majority of their films and series, and the preschool show that the Hensons were making for Disney at the time, Bear and the Big Blue House. The only exceptions were The Muppets Take Manhattan, Muppets from Space, and Kermit Swamp Years, since Sony Pictures retained the rights to those films, and NBC Universal kept It's a Very Merry Muppet Christmas. The Jim Henson Company, on the other hand, on top of ending their deal with Sony Pictures, still held the rights to Jim's other works that aren't related to The Muppet Show or Sesame Street, such as Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas, The Storyteller, the non-Muppet segments of the Jim Henson Hour like Dog City, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Fraggle Rock, and so on. And while Disney also owns the term Muppet, Sesame Workshop got a license from them so that they could still use it to describe their characters, along with showing archival footage that features Kermit. So with this new acquisition, Disney created a new subsidiary specifically for their latest IP called the Muppet Holding Company, which was part of their consumer products division. Their first move after the purchase was to make some TV appearances to give a few shows a little taste of that Muppet chaos, including Saturday Night Live. You guys know my Christmas song? Yeah. Yeah, sure we know your song. You've sung it like three times a year for the last four years. But the big debut of Disney's Muppets wouldn't happen until a year later, where the company wanted to make something with Kermit that was like their good old days in the 1990s where they collaborated on an adaptation. And so, in 2005, they took the pages of L. Frank Baum's classic book and turned them into the Muppets Wizard of Oz. In this version, Dorothy lives in modern-day Kansas and dreams of leaving her trailer park to become a singer. One day, when her aunt and uncle were hiding in the storm shelter to protect themselves from the incoming tornado, the girl ended up staying behind to get her prawn Toto and ended up being carried away which landed her in the Land of Oz, where the Muppets take over to add their own magic to the place. Oh, and her pet is now Pepe for some reason. You're all big, and you're talking. See? But more importantly, I'm Negro Guy. 
However, if she wants to become the star she always wants to be, she must follow the yellow brick road where she'll meet some new whimsical yet oddly familiar friends and avoid the evil Wicked Witch of the West to meet a man who could solve any problem known as the Wizard of Oz. Before the Disney acquisition, there were several Muppet projects that were attempted but never went anywhere. Some involved time travel, a possible Halloween special, and at one point, a Muppet musical version of Hamlet. However, once they moved to Disney, all those plans were dropped. For the Muppets' first official production as a Disney IP, several studios stepped in to make sure that their reintroduction was done right. Of course, Muppet Holding and the Jim Henson Company got involved, but also Fox Television Studios and Touchstone Television stepped in to assist in producing the TV movie. With how the 1939 film is placed as one of the most legendary movies in cinema history, this is not the first time that the Muppets delivered some of that Oz-like whimsy to their performances. For the TV special, The Muppets Go to the Movies, one of the sketches was an homage to The Wizard of Oz, where audiences first witnessed Gonzo as the Tin Man and Fozzie as the Cowardly Lion. Then on Muppet Babies, in the episode By the Book, one of the stories they imagined themselves in was Oz, and coincidentally enough, Kermit, Gonzo, and Fozzie played the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion respectively, just like they did 20 years later for the movie. And even on The Muppet Show, the Muppets once all got together to sing We're Off to See the Wizard. We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. We hear he is the wizard of a wiz, if ever a wiz there was. By the way, do you want to know why the Brooke Shields episode is not on Disney Plus? It's because of this. Yes, exactly this. They cannot get the license to play the song onto their platform. And considering that this is one of the rare episodes that actually has a full linear story throughout the whole thing, instead of just having a bunch of sketches cobbled up together, Disney decided to go and exclude the episode entirely instead of just trying to edit this out and mess up with the whole continuity. Or at least they're going to keep it out until they can resolve the issue. Speaking of that adaptation, despite all the updates they did to make it more themed to showbiz, the Muppets wanted their version to stick closer to the original book that it was based on instead of the classic movie. Explaining some of the key differences between the two films, like how Dorothy was given silver slippers from the Good Witch of the North instead of ruby ones. And as it is a Muppet movie adapting a classic novel, they wanted the main protagonist to be played by a human actor. Some notable actresses auditioned for Dorothy Gale like Hilary Duff and Jessica Simpson, but the one who got the part was Ashanti. Interestingly, this wouldn't be the only time that she found herself in Oz. In 2008, she participated in the Yellow Brick Road Not Taken, a concert celebrating the 5th anniversary of the Broadway show Wicked, and a year later, she reprised her role of Dorothy in the 2009 Broadway revival of The Wiz. One challenge that came with making this picture was for some of the current performers to fill in for the characters of the Muppet veterans who retired. The process already began with It's a Very Merry Muppet Christmas, where Eric Jacobson started to fully try out Frank Oz's roles, and the special was noted to be the start of Kirk Thatcher's position as the Muppets' regular director. But for the Muppets Wizard of Oz, on top of Kirk and Eric taking on their new roles again, including the latter playing as Sam Eagle for the first time in a major production, others had to fill in the gap that Jerry Nelson left. These include John Kennedy playing as Floyd Pepper and Bill Barretta as Lou Zeeland. It's also worth noting that this is where Barretta made his debut as Dr. T, a role that he got to keep since. For the movie's music, Disney hired an up-and-coming composer who started expanding to different fields. He began his career making music and media licensed games during the 1990s like The Lion King and Gargoyles, and then started to gain more traction when he composed for films and television such as ABC's Lost and Pixar's The Incredibles. 
His name was Michael Giacchino, and this wasn't even his first Muppet project that he worked on, since he previously produced the music for the game Muppet Monster Adventure. On Wizard of Oz, Giacchino collaborated with several songwriters like Adam Cohen, Deborah Frank, Jeannie Lurie, and Steve L. Hayes to create the five original songs for the picture, which includes Gotta Get Out of Kansas, When I'm With You, The Witches in the House, Calling All Munchkins, and Good Life. The Muppets Wizard of Oz made its debut on April 27, 2005 at the Tribeca Film Festival and premiered on ABC as part of The Wonderful World of Disney on May 20, 2005. The airing itself was a hit, as 7.75 million viewers in the US watched The Muppets set off to see The Wizard. How they felt afterwards, however, went as well as, well, what you see here. Critics said that the movie was, at best, subpar by the Muppet standards. It may have its witty moments, but they slammed Dorothy's selfish attitude of wanting to be famous, Ashanti's performance, the unnecessary amount of cameos and pop culture references, and the badly out-of-place adult humor. Yeah! How do the producers of Girls Gone Wild do it? It's a Kermit! Yes, folks, the Muppets know what Girls Gone Wild is. Oh, no, wait, no, scratch that. Disney's Muppets know what Girls Gone Wild is. So there you go, there's your double dose of going off-brand awkwardness for the day. <laughs> I feel dirty! <laughs> A weirdo. However, one plus side that did come from the reception was that the song, When I'm With You, received an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Music and Lyrics. I think it's safe to say that this is not among the Muppets' proudest moments, and at worst, it made the public feel less confident about Disney being their new owners. However, it was still a bold move to return to making Muppet-style adaptations and gave more time for the updated team to practice their craft without some of the original Muppet performers with them. Not to mention that this marks as the last time that the Jim Henson Company got to produce a production with the Muppets. This movie may have put them in a low spot, but on the bright side, that yellow brick road to redemption can only go up from there. While The Muppets Wizard of Oz was not favored by audiences, the critical reception did not discourage Disney from giving Kermit and his crew more recognition. On top of promoting a special event that celebrated Kermit the Frog's 50th anniversary throughout 2005 called Celebrating 50 Years of Being Green, where they released DVDs of their past movies, excluding the Sony ones, they were also selling the first three seasons of The Muppet Show on DVD, including the first in 2005, the second in 2007, and the third in 2008. There was also a tour to honor Kermit's 50th that was planned to be a global event. However, Earlier in September of 2004, Michael Eisner announced that he was resigning as CEO of the Walt Disney Company and that he'd give his position to Robert Iger, to which his leadership began in October the following year. One of his first actions as the new boss was changing the staff at Disney, and in Muppets Holding, the head, Chris Curtin, whom Eisner personally picked to lead that sector, received a promotion within the company, and his old position was given to Senior Vice President and General Manager of Baby Einstein, Russell Hampton Jr. His goal with the Muppets was to make sure that the profitability takes top priority instead of Curtin's approach of trying to make them trendy, including having them appear in more commercials and a live show on the Disney Cruise Line called Muppets Ahoy. There was already a reality show that was pitched to ABC called America's Next Muppet, but the channel was hesitant to move forward with that idea. What Hampton did instead was scrap those plans altogether, along with canceling the 50th tour after three stops, and make a deal with the French network TF1 to produce a new series in 2006 called Muppets TV that was only shown in France, along with the Muppets only speaking French and played by French puppeteers. Non, mais enfin, je comprends pas que tu me poses la question. Enfin, c'est simple, je suis le patron, le boss, le fromage de tête, le grand manito, le présentateur, quoi. Ouais, justement, le boss. T'as pas un truc à demander à Pascal Oh, you've never heard about this show Well, to be fair, neither did the French. Or maybe they have heard of it, but they certainly never cared about it. 
especially when it was scheduled at a very inconvenient time slot. The episodes were about an hour each, and fans and the Muppet team were upset of the idea that the Muppets can be casted by multiple different people at the same time. Some fans have even theorized that it was because of Muppets TV that Disney learned their lesson that the Muppets can only be played by one performer at a time. However, another promotion occurred when Hampton became the president of Disney Publishing Worldwide in 2006, and the position was then given to Lily Brayer. She made a significant transformation to the Muppet division by changing its name to The Muppet Studio, and moved it from Disney Consumer Products to her sector, where she led as the Senior Vice President of Special Events at Walt Disney Studios. And as they continue to make their small appearances, like at the New York toy store FAO Shorts, where they opened a boutique to build your own Muppet, at Walt Disney World, where they put out the Muppet Mobile Lab, which was an interactive animatronic of Dr. Bunsen Honeydew and Beaker, and on television with another Christmas special called A Muppet Christmas Letters to Santa in 2008. But then there was one project that suddenly made them popular again. One that came from an unexpected medium. It was not a movie. It was not a new show. It was a YouTube video. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? On November 23rd, 2009, the Muppets uploaded a music video of their cover of Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. They previously produced content for the web before, like the short-lived web series Statler and Waldorf from the Balcony on Movies.com, and had a famous hit before, like Beaker's Ode to Joy, but the Muppets' Bohemian Rap City was the one that made them viral, gathering over 100 million views after its first year, and winning two Webby Awards for Webby's and People's Choice for Best Viral Video. And from there, the Muppets found themselves back in the spotlight, this time as internet stars, not only having their own cooking web show called The Muppet's Kitchen with Cat Cora, but also releasing more viral videos like Ringing of the Bells, Stand By Me, and Popcorn. At the same time, they also became the spokespeople of Give a Day, Get a Disney Day, a volunteering program in 2010 where Disney teamed up with nonprofit organizations to encourage the public to do more volunteer work in exchange for one free admission to the American Disney parks. But as much as the Muppets broke the internet, their newfound comeback was just beginning, and their greatest return awaited them on the big screen. You okay? That was quite a tumble. Hey, thanks for watching! If you've been having fun so far with this series, then give this a like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next parts coming up. Those viral videos may have given them a popularity boost, but you'll see how one fan helped the Muppets return to the mainstream in a major way, even if it was for a brief moment. There's a lot to uncover during the 2010s, but until next time, see you later dudes! This has been an evening to remember. Why? I forgot. Oh! <laughs> <laughs>